Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name's Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about the soil food web, who designed it, what it's all about, negatives, and the pros. For anyone who is new to gardening and who has found this channel, it is not time to start your seeds. Yes, there is the seed starting equipment, the lights, and the seeds in the stores. Um, but just hold off. I promise I will tell you when to start based on your zone. Those videos will actually start, probably start coming out in February. I will give you probably two weeks notice for each one of the zones as to when to start. Little plants transplant way better than bigger plants do. So deep breath, I got you back. If I sound a little stuffed up in this video, it's cause I am. I it's so dry where I am right now I don't know if it's the cold or we have like this really weird freeze thaw thing happening right now um, where I'm in so I just feel sick is basically the moral of the story oh soil food web this is huge right now it's huge for gardening and gardening influencers to talk about it was kind of the premise for kiss the ground documentary on netflix thank you adam for recommending i watch that if you guys want a opinion on the kiss the ground documentary i would love to give you one um some things are a little bit extreme and Hollywoodized <laughs> and then other stuff is on on the hitting the nail on the head but there's there's it's a little over exaggerated in some areas but it's a good documentary regardless of what's happening it's uh gets you passionate about soil that's for sure soil food web is a hot topic and it's kind of the premise for the permaculture movement the no dig movement just composting, manure, all that stuff. So let's jump into exactly what it is. The Soul Food Web was designed by a Dr. Eileen Ingham and I actually have listened to a ton of her podcasts over the years. I've watched lots of her videos. Um, she does have a YouTube channel. There's not a lot on it, but there's some stuff on it. Um, I've read some of the papers that she's written, some of the articles that she's written. So I have a pretty good idea of what she's all about. She's a microbiologist um, and she does not like soil scientists. I'll insert a clip of what she has to say about us. That's one of the things about soil scientists and the way they explain the nitrogen cycle. They forget to tell you about any of the biology. So as you can tell, she thinks that soil scientists are all about nutrients. And I don't know if that's based on what her experience with soil scientists are or if that's her way of selling her concept because she does sell courses and classes for farmers actually on a large scale, not just gardeners. It's actually mostly pertains to large scale farming that she sells courses to. And so the best way to sell courses is to slam the competition, which would be soil scientists and agronomists, because like she said, in some cases, uh, soil scientists and agronomists will cut out the, the microbe side of things. Not in all cases. I mean, the university I went to, the University of Saskatchewan, is very well-rounded in that respect. We did the physics, the chemistry, the biology it was never a nutrients only and my approach to it as a soil scientist is um, diversity and balance is key now I think a lot of agronomists and soil scientists will say what nutrients to add and have a more chemical approach to things mostly because that's what the industry demands from them so if a farmer or a producer is not asking for an alternative or they're not open to alternatives that you have suggested from the biological side, then there's no point in continuing to push that producer in that direction because they're just going to drop you 
as a consultant on their land. Simple as that. So I disagree with her on that. I don't think all soil scientists are stubborn and believe that microbes play no role. I think quite a few soil scientists realize the role microbes play, but if it's a client-based job and it's not a research-based job, it's really hard to push an agenda on someone that's paying you for the results they need. You can make the suggestion, but it just doesn't always pan out that way. Some people are set in their ways. So when she talks about the soil food web, she's talking about all aspects of the food chain. She just calls it the web. So she's including humus and organic material that's then decomposed by microbes, protozoa, fungi, bacteria, and then moves into the bigger stuff like the earthworms and the beetles and then up into the larger things such as animals that are herbivores, carnivores, humans, etc. and so forth. So she's just talking about the food chain, the inputs and the outputs from it. There are some main things she likes to focus on. Number one being no-till, feeding the microbes, and then based on the no-till and the feeding of the microbes and making that soil a really happy place for microbes, which if you didn't watch my video on microbes, then be sure to check that out. I go through exactly how to make a habitat that is happy and healthy for them. Once we've established a good microbial colony, then we have resistance to weeds and we have resistance to diseases and then we have better nutrient cycling and therefore more available nutrients for the plant. All fine and dandy in theory. One thing that she is really big on is actually doing soil samples but not soil samples to test for nutrient values. She actually does soil samples where she looks at the microbes and the number of units of bacteria, fungi, and the diversity of each of those colonies. From there, she works or she gives you a plan to up, scale up those microbes in your soil based on composting, manure, and management styles. Sometimes she has suggested inoculation, which would be the inoculation of a certain microbe that is not present in your soil, but it mostly comes down to the compost and the quality of that compost. So she has had clients or students that have paid for her course that have kept on coming back with tests where the microbe counts were low or they weren't diverse, and it always led back to the type of compost they were using and the diversification in that compost. So she's looking for really high quality compost, really high quality manure that has high levels of fungi and bacteria and protozoa, nematodes and all that stuff. And then based on that, she's looking for microbial balance. From there, her concept is that all nutrients will cycle properly if you have the microbes to back it up and you're able to keep that habitat going. One thing she also is big on is that once you get that microbial colony tugging along, you will not have to water as often, if at all. So she has claims, or she has said, that she has clients that have lawns that have never been watered. It completely runs off of rainwater, and because her compaction is low, her microbes are happy, her flora and fauna are tugging along just fine, that all the water that is ever put into the system is completely utilized. There is zero runoff in her setup. Now, I'm not arguing at all what she's saying. I think that she's on to something. She's definitely on to something. Eileen to sell her course always puts a very heavy emphasis on forest soils and she always draws off the fact that trees are huge organisms that are surviving on a soil with zero inputs. And when you put it that way, it sounds crazy and wild. You're like, yeah, that is a huge 
plant that no is not being fertilized how does it happen well she contributes it all to microbes and a balanced system that hasn't been infiltrated by humans let's put the theory to practice so let's look at that theory and how it is applied in the garden or on our land if we look at microbes and nutrient cycling it is blatantly obvious to anyone with a brain that microbes are integral to the cycling of nutrients. Hands down, will not argue it. Her claim to water sequestration, I guess you could almost say, based on the microbes, I don't, the water, the water bank that happens isn't so much microbes as much as it is the density of the flora in her systems. So she's big on cover crops, she's big on intercropping, so she's packing a lot of plants into a small space. Because of that, she's got a mat of root, and that mat of root means that there's very little soil that is exposed to the elements, and therefore, no, there's not going to be a lot of runoff, and there's not going to be a lot of topsoil loss. She also has a high number of fungi, which obviously, because that is the name of the game when it comes to the soil food web, therefore, you are going to be capturing more water in that sense than a system that is devoid of the mycelial web. These soil food webs look at compaction is that so long as you're following all the directions in regards to cover cropping and the density of plants and the microbes on into the soil that you will not run into compaction which in theory sounds good and because i've been doing so many videos looking at this stuff and looking at these concepts i dug out my old thesis which let me just grab it here real quick so this is my old thesis and i used to be when i was in university I used to believe in wholeheartedly. I thought there was no other way other than organic and cover crops and intercropping and just a all in intensive organic earth benefiting system. Since I've been working in the field and my family farms, I'm actually starting to look at things from a logistical production perspective the two have just crashed into each other in my life and made it so that i've completely realized that it's about balance and there's not one size fits all and one answer is not the case so my thesis was actually on the effects of organic farming management and i looked at the physics the chemistry and the biology. So this is my thesis where I, I look at that. So that's a fun fact about me is my angst against these is not unfounded. It's just, I'm not selling anything. So I'm giving you guys the tools to make a decision as to what you want to buy. Her thoughts on compaction are that it simply will not exist in her soil food web idea. And that may be the case, but it depends on the soil type, which I've referred to before. Heavy clay, pods all soil will compact if you're driving equipment across it, for example, or if you have a lot of rain that's caused compaction or a heavy snowfall. So in the spring, when you guys are driving around, on the grids as we say in saskatchewan down the highways gravel roads that sort of thing look into a farmer's field before it's seeded all the areas where you see water pooling is either for two reasons the water table is high there which is kind of the lesser of the two reasons or secondly there's a compaction layer that's causing that water to sit up in that dip and not drain through. Land naturally sometimes will compact and that's just a fact. There is a government book that soil scientists use. It looks like this. It looks like this. It is the Canadian classification system for soils and 
There's simply soils that can be classified using a government book that naturally are compact and have compaction issues regardless of if they've been touched or untouched land. So there are grasslands out there that naturally have compact soil, even though they've never been farmed, they've never been tilled, the compaction still happens. Her look at forests and how she says forest soils never compact because they have never been tilled is a complete lie <laughs> because in Saskatchewan, for example, in the forestry industry, when you go into a cut block, you have to test the soil for compaction before you begin cutting down the trees. Once you're done in that cut block, we are driving equipment over it, obviously, but we're even driving equipment over it only in winter when the ground is frozen. The reason why we do that is to reduce the compaction even more. And in a forestry operation, there's no till. You're simply just cutting it. If a soil scientist goes in after the fact to do a compaction test and the soil results come back with compaction that is higher than what was tested before the cut block began, remediation needs to take place. So it is required by law that that company then reclaim the land back to its original state. In some cases, the fact that in some cases, these cut blocks still get compacted after they've been looked at. So the document that we use is called, do I have, yeah, I do have one. <laughs> I have a sheet. <laughs> okay, so it's the PESP protocol and it's pretty intense what has to be filled out, um, all in the name of preserving mother nature while taking what we need from it. So the, the look at the PESP report kind of looks like this, basically identifying trees. And then on the soil side, there's all this information. So there's a lot of different, oh, you're not gonna be able to see that. So here we're using actually that soil classification guide to identify our horizons. We're looking at our compaction layers, what was there before, the history, all that stuff. You fill out this before, and then after the winter is done and the, the thaw has come into the ground, we test again. And Elaine would have you believe that no compaction happens in forests, even after equipment's driven over it because the microbes and the roots help prevent against it. It's not the case, it still happens. So in an agriculture setting, it's going to happen regardless. In a garden setting, it won't happen as quickly, but just snow and rain, eventually just pounding on the top may cause compaction. If you have a soil type that compacts easily, like a clay or a podzol, then you may end up with a hard pan layer which can result in issues. There are ways to reclaim that without till, but it is something to watch out for. In a few of her podcasts that I've listened to, a few of her articles she's listened to, she claims, actually on her YouTube channel, she even says this, that she, in her system with the Soil Food Web, she can turn a sandy soil into a black, rich, nutrient dense soil and that is impossible because sandy soils leach out nutrients organic material even just the the humic acid that or the tannic acid that causes that color sand is so quick to alleviate that that when you dig a soil profile in a forest for example which typically in canada and all over the world are on a sandy soil of very very well draining soil, you will see an undisturbed, never touched for hundreds of years since the beginning of time, you will see a humic layer, so a leaf litter layer. Then you will see a tiny little layer of topsoil. And then you'll see a slightly darker brown sand. And then you will see leached sand below that. And I'll insert some photos of what exactly that looks like. But she claims with her system that you, she can transform sandy soil. I have never seen this happen even in mother nature. 
and I have never seen any of her soil profile. I've never seen her dig a soil profile that shows, that can back this claim up. Now, her digging a soil pit would be the complete opposite of her desire. So that may be why she hasn't, but it's just, it's impossible. It's impossible. Mother nature can't even do it. So should we really do it? I just, I cannot see it. So that claim, no, that is an absolute no for me. The claim of weed suppression based on microbes. So she says that if you have a bacterial to fungi mix, like the ratios aren't in balance, then that's what causes weeds. And unfortunately, I'm of the belief that we, a weed is only a weed if you think it is. So technically, grass in your garden is a weed but grass on your lawn isn't. A dandelion on a lawn is a weed, but if you're growing dandelion leaves for salad, then it's not. So microbes aren't going to suppress weeds because if microbes are suppressing weeds, then it's suppressing plants. I obviously have not taken her course because it costs quite a bit of money, but I just don't see, like, I don't understand what she's getting at there because in order for microbes to suppress a plant or a weed, it has to suppress plants. And microbes aren't like, oh, you know what? Ashley does, <laughs> Ashley really doesn't want dandelions in her lawn. So we're gonna suppress the dandelions in the lawn, but the garden that's attached to the lawn, we're just gonna leave the dandelions there because we know she wants to eat those for stuff. Like it just, that makes no sense to me. That is where she starts going. She starts reaching way too far for me. Disease suppression. So I do agree with this a bit. The idea that microbes can suppress disease is not a novel idea. There's a ton of research going into this using microbes and bacteria to fight microbes and bacteria. However, while I do believe in this, I believe in bi using biological controls. Obviously, I use uh, predatory nematodes. I use predatory mites in my potting soil, in my home, on my plants. I be completely believe in using microbes and little mini bugs to help fight off pests and problems. Now, the problem I have with her method is that she's a firm believer that crop rotation is unnecessary. So she believes that through intercropping and cover crops that you can grow corn, for example, on the same field every single year, year after year with no issues. And my problem with this is that plants have a rhizosphere and the rhizosphere is based on what that plant needs. So the plant puts out sugars called exudates that attract microbes that can then digest the nutrients that that plant needs to survive. However, while it builds up beneficial colonies, and if you kept the same crop in the same soil year after year, you will build those beneficial colonies up. It also builds up the non-beneficial bugs. And it does it pretty quickly. And a really great example of how dangerous not using crop rotation can be is just the example of club root in Canada right now. So it came over on cabbage from another part of the world. And I think it was only 10 heads of cabbage that were infected, but now it's actually turning fields in both Alberta and now Saskatchewan into completely obsolete fields for brassica species. So specifically canola in this case. Club root is a seriously detrimental thing and it's a microbe that can be in your soil. It's actually specifically, I'll read the name to you, uh, Plas Plasmidophora brassicae. It was considered slime mold, but is now slime mold, but now is in the group of Phytomyaxae. So it can be found in cabbage, 
Colarupa, Rapini, Rutabaga, Canola. And so it is wicked stuff. And once it's in a field, if you choose to not rotate your crop and you choose to just keep growing canola every single year, what happens is it builds and it builds and it multiplies and it multiplies. And the reason why it's multiplying and getting bigger that field is because because you are getting the exact rhizosphere it needs, the exact exodates it needs to survive. So if we put a five-year rotation in where we don't have cabbage, what will happen is those dangerous microbial colonies will back off and disappear. Because people are greedy and canola is worth so much money, farmers were not following this rule and they would do canola after canola, after canola in their rotation, and it has destroyed fields. In some cases, it can get so bad where canola cannot be grown on those fields whatsoever. So I don't agree with not rotating crops. I think it can actually be very dangerous. If you have a small plot of land um, or a garden, try to rotate within your plot as much as you can because you don't want to build up colonies that are going to completely destroy your potential for ever growing a tomato plant again. And another one just that gardeners will experience is something like powdery mildew. So that can overwinter in foliage and that's another one of her things is that you don't remove the foliage or the plant, you just kind of all let it rot and fall in place. You don't rake it. It all goes back into the same system. If you choose to do that, then you're giving an incubation spot or a little hibernation spot for powdery mildew. So it will come back and kick your butt year after year and get worse year after year. So that's just something that I find a bit hairy carry to me too. There's some management that has to happen there. Mother Nature herself isn't even that perfect because there's a forest up, back to the forest again. Elaine made a great uh, parallel comparison when she used forest because I'm always going back to it too now as well. But there's a forest that is just outside PA in Saskatchewan. So it's just above PA and it has something called mistletoe. And mistletoe is a fungus as well that is attacking the trees in that area, Carnif carnivorous trees in particular, but it makes these really deformed tops, which it affects photosynthesis, it uh, affects the morphology of the tree, all that stuff. So mother nature herself isn't perfect enough with microbial balance to ensure that disease won't destroy an ecosystem because that ecosystem currently is struggling so badly because of this fungi issue that the government is starting to help mother nature deal with it by uh, scheduled prescribed burnings just to help to contain it because if we let it go it will destroy the boreal forest in Saskatchewan it'll just take the whole friggin thing out so mother nature is not even that good humans have the science and the ability to control some of these things is that a good thing? I don't know, but we can, and we can try to preserve it as best as possible. But overall, I think that Dr. Ingham is on to something um, with the soil food web. I think it's a very important topic that we should be looking at. I do think we should be looking at increasing the microbes within the soil, but I don't, the extreme end of no more crop rotation, and there's beautiful weed suppression, and there's huge disease suppression. I just, I can't get there because I've seen people's fields, gardens, acreages, um, forests be completely decimated through improper management and willy nilly nature will, nature will take care of everything mentality. Nature makes mistakes too. And if we can prevent the mistake in hopes of preserving an ecosystem or preserving our garden as arable land for a longer period of time, then I don't see any issue with intervening, but that may be just me.
I hope this explained the Swell Food Web a bit for you guys. I know people always talk about this, but I don't think they realize that it actually goes back to a human being <laughs> and that that human being is selling a course. Like, I don't think uh, people who promote Soil Food Web understand what that goes back to you. I don't know. Maybe they do. I have no idea. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.